Welcome, everybody. There's joy in the house of the Lord. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God is still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in His place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, and redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out the praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out the praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. declare the glory of the Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would reign in us to even today. Won't you stand if you can as we sing, Lord, reign in me. Let's go. 
So won't you reign in me again? Over every thought. Over every thought. Over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me? again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour. You are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour. You are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again. Reign. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Uh, it goes on to say, cleanse your hands and make your hearts pure. Let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire.
Lord God, you are worthy of all our praise, attention, and dedication. You said that if we draw near to you with a pure heart, you would not turn us away, but would receive us with open arms. We will live life faithful to you and walk worthy of our calling, pleasing you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. All right, welcome to worship uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to ask Sharon Ruder to come forward. She is going to share with us some information about the upcoming uh, Holiday Bazaar, which, what's the date? November 6th, that's a Saturday. So Sharon, take it away. Good morning. Oh, that was a good greeting. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to stand up here and talk about the return of the bazaar. Are we excited? Oh, come on. Yes. Yay. Clap. Yay. Okay. Um, in your uh, handouts this morning, on the back of the first page, there is a whole list of things about the bazaar, all the things included. So I'm not going to read this. I'm going to let you read it. You go over and look at it. I'm just going to add some things that are not on here, some basic information. Um, everything's going to go on as it normally has the past years. There will be so a few adjustments to the lunch that Sharon Saloff and her crew are working very diligently to keep everything safe and up to par with the uh, uh, health department code. Um, a couple things that will be coming up, like next week we will have yard signs available. So if you have a yard that's in a good location where people will, you know, be able to see it and you'd, you'd like a, a sign put in your yard, uh, there will be a crew coming around and putting up signs or they will be available next week. So see me after in the gathering room and let me know you would like to take a sign. Next week also we will have flyers available that you can take to your place of work or give to your friends or your family. Uh, there's two different size flyers. If everybody would take a couple of flyers and just hand them out and spread the word. And of course also now, today, there's social media. If you are on social media, if you would share the information about the bazaar on your social media site, that certainly would help too. We want to get out as much advertising as we can. Uh, next, the next three weeks, out, uh, many of you will remember, you know, we have the tables set up out in the gathering room, and there'll be all the different things you can sign up for to bring or volunteer. We need lots of volunteers, both women and men. And if you read your flyer here in your handout, that tells you all the ways you can help. We also, next week, will start selling tickets for the quilt and the needlepoint items that will be included in the raffle. Sometimes people like to get those early. So a little homework assignment for all of you. I know sometimes pastor gives homework, but I'm going to give homework today. I don't think he gave homework this morning. So don't throw this away when you leave, but take it home, think about, pray about what you would like to do, what you can do whether it's giving some kind of donation or giving your time. And when you, when you think about this and pray about this, think about what your donation, what your donation of time or money or items might do to help that cancer patient or that child with a catastrophic illness or a homeless person or uh, a family that needs food because all the proceeds from the bazaar go to chari local charities and organizations that serve others. So think about how you can do God's work and serve others by how you contribute to the bazaar. And it's a fun day, as Pastor's going to say. So if you have any questions, I will be out in the gathering room afterwards to answer those questions. So thank you for your time.
thank you, Sharon, for uh, all the organization and time that you put into putting the bazaar together. And let me just encourage all of you to make sure you at least attend the bazaar for an hour or two and check out all the fun stuff going on. Um, it's, it's definitely worth it. Uh, you'll have an enjoyable day. And it's for a worthy cause. All right. Oh, need my flipper. There we go. Okay. Well, good morning. I am Pastor Mark Gibbs. Uh, welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary. And those of you joining us on the stream this morning, we're delighted you could be with us today. Um, all right, let's see what we got going here this morning. There we go. The scripture lesson I'm going to use today is from Luke chapter 7, beginning with the 36th verse. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. There we go. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, who had invited Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, and in other words what he means here, if this man really were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, uh, I'll be working with that scripture in just a minute. Uh, but before we do that, I want to visit our memory verse uh, that we've been working on for the past two weeks. And that memory verse is from Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Let's uh, practice this together. We'll practice it a couple times, then we're going to try it uh, from memory. Are we ready? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's do that again. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, let's uh, do that from memory, okay? Are we ready? Turn your, turn your uh, uh, sermon notes upside down so that you, you can't see them. All right, here we go. Are we ready? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, let's do that again. Are we ready? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, very good. All right, so um, hopefully you've taken that scripture into your heart. Hopefully that'll be a resource for you to use, uh, you know, uh, uh, a message from God to draw on uh, in your daily life as you're, as you're living your life. We'll work on a, another uh, memory verse starting next week. All right, so the name of my message today is, Do You See Them With My Eyes? Uh, I think that's a, a, a good question that, that God is always asking us. Do you see them, them being other people, uh, your neighbors, uh, strangers, uh, people at the margins of society? Do you see them with my eyes, God asked us. Um, this past week, myself and my wife uh, and Sean and Gary Sears, we went down to the Lutheran Congregation and Mission for Christ Annual Assembly. It was being held in uh, Colum- the Columbus area, Columbus, Ohio uh, area. And uh, so we went down there and spent a couple days uh, listening to various speakers and, and fellowshipping with uh, other people from our church all across uh, the United States. And uh, so I thought it would be um, uh, appropriate for me to bring you something back from the assembly, something that I learned. Um, I, I told my wife, when I go to these things, I keep a pad with me, and, and I try to write down, if I hear like a little, what I call a nugget, you know, if it's like, okay, that's a nugget of, of scriptural truth right there, or a nugget of, of some kind of godly truth, I will write those down. Um, and, and so that I can bring them back and incorporate them into my own preaching. Um, and so I want to do that today. I want to bring you something back. There were lots of nuggets at this, at this assembly. Am I right, Gary? Yeah, there was a lot of good nuggets. And uh, so what I want to share with you today is uh, a little bit uh, got me thinking uh, from a talk um, that one of the guys gave on the very first day on, on, on Monday morning, uh, one of the keynote speakers. Um, he began by talking about how the last 18 months um, for all of us gathered there at, at the gathering, uh, all of us, uh, you know, church leaders and, and pastors and so forth, um, it's been a hard 18 months. I mean, it's all uncharted waters. I mean, like, we were making up the rules as we were going along, weren't we, trying to figure out what's the right thing to do, um, you know, how much activity can we have in the church or, or should we be totally shut down? When was the right time to shut down? When was the right time to open back up and, and so forth? And uh, it, was a, it, was really, it was really tough. And, and um, a common theme with everyone that I talked to was that it tended to stretch our love for one another, <laughs> right? I mean, it's like uh, our frustrations would build up. We would lose our tempers. Uh, we'd get frustrated with each other, and so that uh, tended to stretch those those bonds of harmony um, that we share as Christians, and in general in society. I mean, it just wasn't happening in the church. I mean, the church is kind of a microcosm of what was happening out in the larger world as well. Um, so there was a lot of talk about: Are we getting back to normal? Is it is it time for us to try to get back to normal? Um, and I, I think we see some light at the end of the tunnel, um, and, and I'm hopeful that we will be getting back to, to normal sometime within the next few months, if not within the next year. So, um, so that's some good news. Um, we also talked about how, uh, you know, it just seems like the pandemic kind of set off um, a, 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 like a, a race, like a, a race to be... Um, to a race to rip off all of uh, of the manners that we had on society, you know, it's like we uh, we 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 like to think that we live in a civil society, right? We live in a society where people, even when they disagree, are not disagreeable to one another. But that's kind of just been tossed to the wayside, hasn't it? I mean, people. Uh, you know, especially in social media, just are just telling you what they think, um, and they're not very nice about it. And um, and so, one of the things that the speaker talked about is how um, we kind of divide ourselves into groups, and and so these groups over here that don't identify with my group or don't agree with my group, 
We start to think of them as adversaries. We start to think of them as enemies. And sometimes we even talk about them as being evil. Um, and so the, the speaker asks the question, but how does Jesus view those people? In other words, he's asking the questions, do, do you, the way you view those people, is it the same as the way that Jesus views those people? And so he used this gospel lesson that I just shared with you from Luke chapter 7. And um, you'll notice in this story that there's really, there's two groups of people in this story. There's the Pharisees, and then there's the group of people that the woman represents. Okay, so you have, you have the, the insiders, okay, you have these Pharisees who think of themselves as being very religious. They think of themselves as righteous before God. They think of themselves as having all the knowledge of God that they need. And so they have a tendency to separate people, to separate them into two categories, righteous and sinners. And they put themselves squarely in the category of being righteous. And along comes this woman. And, and she really re represents all sinners, okay? All sinners everywhere. Um, she's, you know, she's symbolic um, for all the people um, that get pushed to the margins of society. Um, our scripture just tells us that she's a sinner. Um, we don't really know what her sin is, but you can bet it was something pretty heinous, um, it, it, you know, for, for, the, for these uh, Pharisees to, to call her out on it. It was, it was obvious, uh, according uh, to the Pharisees. So, the question becomes, does Jesus divide people into the righteous and the sinners? And if you look at this story, the turning point is in the story, I think, is when Jesus turns to the woman and he says, Simon who is the Pharisee, he says, Simon, do you see this woman? Now, I think it's sometimes we kind of like just think of that as a transition phrase and we just kind of gloss over it, but I think it's really important. You know, what is Jesus asking here? He's saying, Simon, do you really see this woman for who she really is? Okay. Because as far as Simon's concerned, she's just a sinner who has no value. In fact, she's an enemy of the righteous. She shouldn't be in this place. Her presence in this place is just contaminating the place. And so then Jesus immediately goes into this discussion of the parable of the greater or the lesser debtor. Okay, So uh, in that story, let me just refresh it for you. There were two people. One owed uh, a, a, a rich man uh, 50 days' wages. Another owed the rich man 500 days' wages. Neither of those two people could pay the guy back. And so the rich man decides to just forgive their sin, and to forgive, their, forgive their debt. And, uh, and then Jesus turns to Simon and says, Okay, of those two people who had their debts forgiven, which one probably loves the rich man more. And Simon the Pharisee says, well, the one who was forgiven the most. And Jesus turns to the woman and says to Simon, this woman, you know, she's, she's a sinner and she loves me more because I forgive her more. And the implication is that Simon, the man who thinks he's righteous, loves Jesus very little because he thinks he needs to be forgiven very little. And so what Jesus is lifting up here is that, you know, what, what's, what's more important here? What's more important? Is, is grace import, more important or is merit most important? Now, we all know, we all know the answer to that, right? We have all sinned and fallen short of the God, uh, of the glory of God. And and this Pharisee is fooling himself, isn't he? If he thinks he's righteous because of his own doing, okay, how many of us ever, you know, have ever had a single day where we have gone through life on that single day uh, and had 
completely pure thoughts, said completely uh, pure things to all of the people that we meet, never said a selfish thing, never had a selfish thought, um, never did a, a selfish act. How many of us can say we've even had one day like that? We haven't. The prophet Isaiah said that our righteousness, our human righteousness, is like filthy rags when compared to the righteousness of God. So what's Jesus saying here? He's saying we're all in the same boat. We human beings are mortal, fallible creatures, and we sin. And every day we need grace. Every day we need God forgiving us. That's unmerited grace. That's how much God loves us. He forgives our sins every day. We're like the woman, right? We, we, we've sinned. We need to throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus. We need to bathe His feet with our tears. For we merit nothing. And that's the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach this Pharisee. We were, we are, we will always be sinners. And it's only because of God's forgiveness of that sin that we can even love. Think about that. Um, in uh, the Apostle John's first letter to the church, he says this, John, uh, 1 John 4.19, We love because He first loved us. Okay? So, if, if, if you want to love, okay, um, then you have to first receive that love from God. And you can only do that um, if you're willing to make your relationship right with Him. And the way you do that is by going to Him and throwing yourself at His feet on a daily basis and asking for forgiveness of the sins of which you are sorry. So, what Jesus is saying here is that you need to have a new set of eyes. You have to have spiritual eyes. And spiritual eyes are really God's eyes. God wants to give you the same kind of spiritual sight with which He looks at the world. And so that's, that's an important question for us to ask ourselves. Do I see others with God's eyes? You see, as Christians, we are not and should not primarily see other people and judge other people in, in these kinds of terms of like good and evil. Are they good? Are they evil? Are they rich? Are they poor? Are they strong or weak? Are they Republican or Democrat? Are they conservative or are they liberal? Are they white or black? Are they rural or urban? Are they smart or dumb or nice or mean? That's, that's how people in the world judge everybody, isn't it? We're all the time putting people in different kinds of categories, aren't we? And the list could go on and on, couldn't it? But this is not who we are as Christians. Or at least it's not who we should be. This is not looking at other people with God's eyes. Well, how does God look at other people? The only category with which God looks at other people, is this. He looks at you and wants to know, are you lost or are you found? If you're found, He rejoices. If you're lost, He's perplexed. He's, he's concerned. He will hound you until you get found. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's what our, who our God is. That's what He does. Hey, he will hound you. He will come after you until you say yes to being found. All right? So are you lost or found? And so think about it. That's really the eyes with which we should be looking at people. We should be rejoicing with those people who are found. That's what, you know, we're gathered here as the body of Christ this morning, and we rejoice. We rejoice together, not because of what we've done, but because of what God has done for us. He's found us. And then we should look on other people and ask the question, are they lost or are they found? If they're found, we rejoice with them. If they're lost, 
then we look on them as Jesus looked on them. You know, it's clear from that story, isn't it, that we just read, that when Jesus looked on that woman who was at his feet crying, he, he looked on her with compassion. He had such love and compassion for her. And I'm sure he, if he wasn't crying with his eyes, he was crying in his heart. Um, and that's how we ought to be when we're looking at people in the world. If we see people who are lost, all right, we shouldn't condemn them, shouldn't push them away. We shouldn't uh, say, I can't have anything to do with them. That's what the Pharisees said, right? I can't have anything to do with her. She's a sinner. She's going to contaminate me. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus let that woman come up and touch him. And Jesus is asking us to do the same thing figuratively. He's asking us to, to go to those people, talk to them, build a relationship with them, pray for them, serve them, speak kindly to them, and when the opportunity arises at the right time, speak words of salvation to them. Speak the gospel, the good news of Jesus to them. Tell them that God loves them, that there's no sin that they've committed that God can't forgive. There's nothing that can separate them from the love of God if they allow God to come to them and find them. We need to hear this. We need to be this kind of lost and found people. Think of that story in the gospel, the prodigal son. In the prodigal son, the younger son takes his inheritance and goes off and he blows it in what they call dissolute living, okay? He was a partier, okay? I mean, there wasn't any substance that he didn't try, right? I mean, he, was a, he, was, he just blew it and he ended up with nothing. And so he crawls back to his dad and he says, Dad, accept me as a slave, and I'll work for you as one of your slaves. But the father accepts him back, puts a robe around him, puts a ring on his finger, kills the fatted calf, throws a big party. The prodigal son is the sinful woman in our story today. They're, they're akin. They're brothers and sisters. But then there's the older brother, right? And the older brother sees this party being thrown, and he he goes to his dad and says, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Don't you know what kind of sinner your younger son is? Don't you know what he did to you? And the father says to him, yeah, I know, I know all that. But, but son, realize your younger brother was lost, and now he's found. Your younger brother was dead, and now he's alive again. We have to to celebrate. And that's what the gospel is about. The gospel is about finding dead people and raising them to life. It's about finding lost people and bringing them back to God where they are truly found. That's what it means to be a Christian. Nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. That's the kind of church we need to be. Um, one of the other speakers at the conference said that in the church, we are not on the left, we are not on the right. Okay, We are not conservative, we are not liberal, and all those other this or that's. We are in the radical middle. And she distinguished that from the mushy middle, okay? We're not the mushy middle where we accept everything and we try to be all things to all people. We are in the radical middle. And the radical middle says this, there is only one king of the universe. There is only one God, and we serve that God first, okay? You can be a Democrat. You can be a Republican. You can be a conservative. You can be a liberal but you better first be bowing before the only king who is eternal, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the radical middle. Jesus is first in all things. And you better be looking at the world through Jesus' eyes. Let me share with you 
uh, two things. First of all, John, uh, 1 John chapter 20, uh, John followed that, that John 19, John 4, 19, which said, we love because he first loved us. Then he says this immediately, whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have seen. So think about that. If you can't look with Jesus' eyes on your brothers and sisters in the world, then you can't really love God. So don't let the world turn you into something that you're not. Okay? And finally, this. This is from Mark chapter 6, 34. When Jesus saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so what did he do? He began to teach them many things. Okay, So let me go back to this. When Jesus saw people who were lost, his first reaction was not to be angry, not to sit in judgment over them and say, oh, those those silly people, those poor people, oh, you know, he didn't write them off. That wasn't his first reaction. His first reaction was to have compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Folks, the only shepherd that matters is Jesus. And there's a whole lot more people out in the world who don't follow Jesus, who don't know Jesus, who don't have Jesus as their shepherd than there are who do. There's a whole mission field out there. And Jesus is calling us to go into that mission field and minister to those people, to do what he does, to begin to teach them many things by the way we pray, by the way we serve, by the way we speak. Don't let all the false vo voices out in the world teach you to be something that you are not. This is who you are. Never forget that. But Jesus, we pray you make us into these kinds of people. In your holy name we pray, amen. All right, um, we're going to do some more praying here. Um, let me first ask, are there any joys that you'd like to share with the congregation this morning? Yes. Isabel, congratulations, going to be a teenager. That's awesome. Happy birthday. Anyone else have a birthday? Anniversary, any other joy? Got some from the stream? Uh, well, they're not joys just yet. These are prayer requests. Okay, anyone else? All right. Um, how about additions to our prayer list? Anyone that we should add? I'm going to add Chuck Hopkins. Uh, this is Donna, Donna Beckler's neighbor is having kidney failure, so we want to pray for, for Chuck. Also on the stream... Um, here from Christine Bischoff, she tells us that her friend Laurel is fighting an infection, so we'll pray for Laurel. And we want to pray for the family and friends of Jim Likens. Uh, this is Tina Vogley's uh, son-in-law. Um, he passed away. Jim Likens. Anyone else? Yes, Gary. Okay. Pray for Scott. Cancer treatment. Yes. Okay, um, Jim and Haley Bung. Okay, their baby has RSV. Okay, anyone else we should pray for? All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, what a joy it is to be here in your house today. You've called us here. You've gathered us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we come together, and we just celebrate. We just celebrate all that you, Lord God, have done for us, all your many blessings. But, but most of all, we thank you for the grace that you've poured out to us, the mercy you've poured out on us through your son Jesus and through his sacrifice on the cross. And so we come, uh, as is our practice to daily, humbly come before you and acknowledge our sinfulness and to ask 
that you wash those sins away from our souls. Um, in Psalm 103, uh, you said, Lord, that you will uh, remove those sins from us as far as the east is from the west, and you will make us white as snow. And so we take you at your word. We trust you, Lord, that, that you are at this very moment uh, removing from us uh, those sinful things that, that separate us from you, that get in the way of our relationship with you so that you can draw us close to you, so that we can live in an intimate, life-giving relationship with you. What a, what a joy, what a promise that is to receive from the God of the universe. And so we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, that we who were lost have been found. But that behooves us also then to lift up prayers for those folks who are still lost. Uh, and Lord, sometimes... They get on our nerves. Sometimes they can be mean to us. Uh, sometimes they can frustrate us terribly. But even so, your son looks upon them with mercy, with merciful eyes. And so we pray, Father, that you will help us to do the same, uh, to not judge them in the ways that the world judges, but to simply judge them as lost or found. And if they're found, we will rejoice with them. If they're lost, we will love them. We will love them into the kingdom. We'll take whatever time it takes. We will not give up on them. We will not push them aside. We will not write them off. For we know, Lord, that you created them, and you don't make junk. And, uh, and they are of value to you. And if they are of value to you, they are valuable to us. At least we want to live that way. Sometimes our sinfulness gets in the way, but we pray, Father, that that will become our attitude, that we will very quietly and very consistently, very, in a very steady manner, serve them, love them, and not judge them. We will leave the judging up to you. Um, Lord, we pray that you will help us to make uh, finding the lost and bringing them into the kingdom our primary reason for being. Um, that's why you created us, was to build a kingdom, a kingdom of people who worship you, who praise you, who love you, who want to be in your presence. That's who we want to be, Lord. We're not quite there yet, but we hope and pray you'll get us there. And so we place ourselves in your hands. And we pray for the lost everywhere. We pray, Lord, that you are at this moment, softening hard hearts, that you're helping people see the error of their ways. We pray that you will show us how to serve them with acts of kindness and how to speak to them in ways that build up and don't tear down, in ways that will be fruitful in leading them to meet and know Jesus. So show us, Lord. Prepare us for the work at hand. As we leave this place, we go into the mission field. Help us every minute of the day to be aware of that, that we are in the mission field, that we might be the only Jesus that some people meet on any particular day. Help us to rise to the task. Help us to serve you as you would have us serve you. So come, Lord Jesus. Come into our world. Transform our world into the place, into that that kingdom to come that you so desire. And through it all, we're going to continue to worship you and praise you and honor you. Lord, we, we lifted up several people here who are in need of prayer. We want to pray for Chuck. We want to pray for Scott. We want to pray for the Jim and Haley Bung as, and, and their baby for healing. We pray for Laurel as she's fighting an infection. And we pray for the family and friends of Jim Likens. We pray you'll bring Tina and, and her family and friends the comfort and consolation that they require. Um, losing a loved one is very, very hard, very difficult, Lord. So we pray for a special blessing upon Tina and her family and her daughter. So we lift these things up to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Give us his eyes, Lord. Give us his eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Would you pray with me the words our Savior taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for listening to me today. Um, Have a great, blessed week uh, in the week to come. Take care. Oh, I guess I should announce the uh, offering. Yeah, yeah. Judy, come on forward and uh, we'll collect the offering. given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God, that we shall be called the sons of God. Amen. Won't you stand if you can for our closing song? Today is the day.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.